and thanks everybody for being here. Let me say before I get started um, that this is material that I've pulled out of my dissertation. This is some material that I've been thinking about for a while, how race and increasingly how class have kind of worked together with the effort to build a hydroelectric complex in the U.S. South, basically from the beginning of the 20th century, uh, certainly through the early New Deal era, but perhaps beyond that as well. But again, today I'll focus on the progressive era, maybe the broader progressive era going into the 1920s uh, in this piece titled, I hope provocatively, but not uh, controversially, Lucy, uh, Idle Slaves in the South. <laughs> So in a live broadcast over the WSB radio station in Atlanta in the mid-1920s, a man named Preston Arkwright, who was president of the Georgia Railway and Power Company, which is now the Georgia Power Company, if anybody's familiar. And here is an image of Preston Arkwright. So Arkwright listed for his audience over the radio the many wonders of hydroelectricity. Uh, among the many things that he listed, the most significant was that this marvelous, marvelous technology like so many unfree laborers in a previous age, had the power to ease the burdens of even the humblest, most work-weary white Southerners. The state's rivers stood ready, he claimed, to serve the white South as a gang of faithful souls that would honor this incarnation of the peculiar institution without a thought of quarreling, working slowly, stealing food, breaking tools, or running away. Lots of things that people complained about in the age of slavery that slaves would do to subvert the system. Rather, he stated, these chattels would happily take on their shoulders the burden of labor. They are freeing men and women from drudgery. Every day they are mitigating more and more the sentence pronounced on man for Adam's disobedience. They are wiping away the sweat from men's faces. They are converting laborers into directors of labor. So then, the water's energy promised a return in the future to some certain type of Eden. We might more fittingly say that with the restoration of a certain type of coerced labor, hydropower promised the arrival of a 20th century neo-antebellum utopia in which each white southerner, regardless of class status, would become a slave master. So Arkwright's allusions, his rather clear allusions I would suggest, to hydroelectricity as a means to reanimate at least some version of slavery might seem on the surface to be a little more than boilerplate 1920s corporate conservationism with a bit of a southern twang. After all, the claim that water power could act as a sort of menial labor force that would liberate industrial drudges wasn't unique to the South in the early 20th century. Hopeful observers across the U.S. and even in Europe endowed hydroelectricity with the capacity to wipe clean the sooty, smoky, coal-fired 19th century city and to ease the backbreaking strain associated with urban industrial life. Indeed, boasts of shackling rivers for the generation of electricity and enjoying the resultant modern slavery, a term that's often tossed around. These were common coin in the realm of progressive era conservation and in the realm of business, it should also be said. So consider, for instance, this general electric advertisement from the 1920s. It's from 1926, in fact, which tells readers that electric heat, light, and transportation were America's slaves and were responsible for freeing men. I don't know if you can read the text, but th these ideas are both in the text. And the idea here is borrowed from Oscar Wilde's thoughts about mechanical slavery. If you've uh, read Wilde's thoughts on socialism before, he discusses what mechanical slavery will mean for the future. The idea that machines would replace human labor. But quite tellingly, this abstraction in the advertisement we see here is given a body, and I think it's not coincidental that it's a black body. And this idea plugged into larger, widespread discourses. The depiction of modern consumer items in general as servants first appeared in mass by the early 1890s, perhaps most notably with the arrival of the image of Aunt Jemima, but became only more widespread after the turn of the century. Quite often, the faithful slave stereotypes of mammy and the uncle and the pickaninny and so on and so forth were employed to convey just how helpful the help would be. These strategies, historian Grace Hale writes, <clears throat> excuse me, merged the service of a particular product with the service of black figures used in promoting it. The magnification of racially figured subservience occurred in these promotional, promotional materials 
as servant slash slave labor worked for the white consumer. African Americans, whether symbolically or materially, I would suggest both, worked for the white folks. Being white, being a modern American, meant having some kind of black help. So American life in the early 20th century was saturated with images about product servants that would eliminate or at least significantly reduce white people's need to work. But back to Preston Arkwright. His description of electric energy's potential for reviving slavery was particularly resonant in the South. For Dixie's white residents, the central moments in their history, even in the 1910s and 1920s, were still the Civil War and Reconstruction, which were interpreted as intertwined revolutions that saw an overreaching federal government rob Southerners of their supposed God-given mastery over African Americans. This history of loss weighed heavily on white Southern life and conscious for nearly a century. I suppose we can say it still does very much to this day, but proved perhaps most burdensome between the 1880s and the 1920s when business-minded elites very clearly and quite loudly advocated for a path away from the purportedly organic life of the countryside and the farm and toward the corporate capitalist world of the city and the factory. This is the world that often has been referred to as the New South. And the person I give you here as an image is Henry Grady, the foremost prophet, as they were called, of the New South order. And so these are just a couple of words that he has to suggest about what the New South was. But anyway, the shift from Old South to New South signified to many of Dixie's residents that the Old South had, in fact, been deterritorialized. White supremacy's legal and material basis, the plantation, ideas of paternalism, the countryside, had all been uprooted from the places in which slavery and white supremacy had all been grounded. And this revolution proved particularly problematic for the masses of working whites who, in steadily increasing numbers, lost their places on the farm and had to seek work in the factory. So the peculiarities of Southern life and history in the early 1900s demanded that the selling of hydroelectrification and the selling of the broader New South program which I would suggest is a, um, critically tied up with hydroelectricity, that these things be refracted through both discourses and practices meant to soothe shared worries over a society in a liminal state. In the hands of Georgia's power brokers, seemingly generic, commonplace American conservationist notions about enslaving rivers and eradicating labor communicated the idea that hydroelectricity would, would enable the white South not only to make material and moral progress, in the modern world, but to regenerate the mastery that it had lost in Civil War and in Reconstruction as well. So then in what follows, I consider some of the methods Southern power promoters employed for translating hydroelectric modernity to the public, to the especially white public. No longer firmly grounded in the seemingly ancient soil and rules of the plantation, power promoters attempted to anchor white supremacy in the region's flowing water and in the increasingly novel places of the New South. So in order to demonstrate how a seemingly national conservationist rhetoric spoke specifically to white Southerners about the recovery of their superiority through the construction of a hydroelectric complex, I'll first very, very briefly gloss the deep history of the loss of white mastery, and then talk a bit about how hydroelectricity became something of a means to get it back. It would be a fair question to ask at this point or at any who these power promoters like Preston Arkwright were actually attempting to talk to. And that's an important consideration, um, but it would be a bit of a different discussion. What I'm aiming to do here instead is to demonstrate that regardless of political positions, intended audiences, race and hydroelectricity were mutually reinforcing properties in the early 20th century South. In other words, race, nature, and energy were co-produced in this context a point that I think Southern historians, environmental historians, and energy historians seem for the most part to have missed. It's further possible, furthermore possible, to grasp the centrality of environment, environmental manipulation, modern technologies, and energy development in, in the construction of this New South program, a program, again, that promised to recapture cross-class white dominance over African Americans, but in fact worked toward elite dominance over the masses of both black and white Southerners. Uh, before I go any further, let me just uh, very quickly say that African Americans in the South certainly had uh, ideas and high hopes for what life in the electric age could offer. And although that's a topic uh, beyond the scope of this talk, I'll be glad to discuss that in Q&A uh, if you wish. So 
So there was a time, of course, when white supremacy was at least theoretically assured to all white Southerners, whether slaves labored directly for them or not. In the idealized version of the antebellum past, individual white men were masters of the private worlds of their self-contained farms. Collectively, all white Southern men lorded over their society. The basis of that mastery was the enslavement of African Americans on, farge, on farms large and small in the countryside. Even though a majority of Southerners owned no slaves, the slave regime's supposed hair invoked democracy held that even the lowliest of whites was technically superior to all blacks. Such domination was reflected and engendered in everyday social interactions, in economic practices, and in state and local laws. Constitutional provisions, national policy, and American jurisprudence, of course, we all know, further reinforced disorder. But the bloody upheavals of the 1860s and 70s destroyed the structures in which antebellum meanings and hierarchies of race were grounded. In order to recover what they had lost then, white Southerners pursued a variety of projects aimed at the renewal of total control over their world. These included some familiar things like the Black Codes, the rise of the Ku Klux Klan and their night riding, spectacle lynching, the Jim Crow legal apparatus, political disfranchisement, and among other things, mass bloodletting in race riots in cities across the South. Yet the campaigns to reestablish dominion over African Americans testified not to the security of white supremacy as we might assume, but to its fundamental instability in the years between the mid 1860s and the 1920s. The racial hierarchy had to be constantly remade in the late 19th and early 20th century South. At its core, the antebellum slave regime was one, of course, of coerced labor. Southerners' attempts to reconstitute the unfree workforce in the years after emancipation, which many of these things that I just mentioned were aimed at doing, met with some successes, but mostly met with failures. But try as they might, the white South could not recreate the idealized world of slavery and could not firmly plant themselves once again, uh, um, unquestionably atop the postbellum increasingly urban industrial racial terrain that was constantly shifting. Southern electric boosters, whether they worked for private companies or challenged private companies, stepped into this breach. They proposed that Southern whites could be relieved of the stresses of the modern world and recover the racial ordering of the old world through the conquest of the region's rivers for the generation of electric power. In order to realize a neo antebellum future in the New South then, rivers were called on to get to work. The forces publicizing the shackling of the South's waterscape consistently highlighted this theme. Quite tellingly, Georgia's hydropower developers focused particularly on how lazy and unproductive Southern rivers had been, absent the civilizing influence of human domination. And that always cracks me up too. A, record, a rhetorical device, I think, uh, that, that's quite telling. It's a rhetorical device that mimicked the widely held thinking about the moral uplift of the slave regime and then the degraded state of the work ethic of African Americans after emancipation. So a Georgia Railway and Power Company publication, for example, claimed that until it began developing the state's hydraulic resources, the rivers flowing from Georgia's Blue Ridge Mountains were content to loiter. <laughs> Southern Power Company financier James Duke, of course that became Duke Power and I think it's Duke Energy today, urged the South to mine the region's abundant seams of white coal that for all of time had been flowing in waste to the sea. So the solution, I'll go ahead and change slides for you. The solution to such idleness was to instill in the state's rivers a new work ethic. The Atlanta Constitution, which was the city's main daily newspaper, commented that whereas the potential energy of Georgia's Blue Ridge Mountain rivers had been wasted for all eternity, now these magnificent rivers are to supply utility, they are made to work. Among the first of these facilities to make rivers work was the Morgan Falls Dam at Bull Sluice on the Chattahoochee River, which is about 17 or so miles north of Atlanta, built and operated by the S. Morgan Smith Company of York, Pennsylvania, whose corporate records are, as it happens, housed here at the Archive Center. It's mostly photos and catalogs for turbines, but the photos are, are quite wonderful, I have to say. This is the Chattahoochee River, in 1904 after the completion of the Morgan Falls Dam at Bull Sluice. 
brought online, like I said, in 1904. This dam drew praise for a number of reasons, the first of which was the dam's success in placing a so-called bit and a bridle on the river. The Chattahoochee was compared to a wild steed whose boundless energy would do immeasurable good for the South if only it were tamed. The facilities at Bull Sluice had finally brought this beast to heel. And we can see kind of the civilizing process of the river at this point. This is the dam under construction. And here we can also, if you look kind of in the middle of the image, you can see a group of well-dressed ladies getting a flyby tour of this civilizing process. So with the dam in place, the Constitution went on. The capital of the New South, which Atlanta claimed, a title Atlanta claimed for itself, was poised to make great progress by taking advantage of the recently channeled horsepower, this is the, the paper's words, the horsepower that for all eternity had galloped untamed past the gates of the city. Now certainly horsepower was a common enough term at the time, and it still is of course, to describe the amount of energy an engine could produce. And while a direct reference to slavery was not made in this instance, it's important to note that hydropower was given a body, that of the horse, that of the beast, that was forced to work for the social and economic betterment of the larger New South. And then it wasn't much of a leap to conflate equine and African-American bodies in labor and their potential around the turn of the century in ways that to us are, of course, horrific, but were maybe unthinking uh, to many white Southerners at the time. For one disturbing example of this, in 1902, a newly invented electrical whip drew admiration as a tool to discipline in exactly the same manner the working rhythms of plow horses and African-American laborers. Plans for the electrical whip included an attachment, the paper's words, an attachment whereby the mule and the plow hand shall be shocked every few minutes. It's believed that such an attachment would find a tremendous sale all over the South as by its use, farmers could be very sure that no Negro would go to sleep between the plow handles. The way, Bull Sluice, the, way the Bull Sluice project and other electrical technologies were described spoke volumes to the white people of the South who continued to measure their level of mastery against the simultaneously idyllic and brutally dehumanizing scenes of the plantation. So if the main Atlanta Daily vocally endorsed hydroelectricity's potential to set the South right again in, in more ways than one, it most often fell to Preston Arkwright, if I can bring him up once again, to call on Georgia's rivers to toil for the state's citizens. Hydroelectricity developed in his company's extensive network, depicted here in a couple of different ways, would relieve white Southerners of many of the burdens of work, lifting the yoke, in Arkwright's words, from the white worker's shoulders, placing that weighty responsibility instead on its own. So on the left is a map of the transmission system, and on the right is a map of the serial development of the Tallulah Tugaloo River system in the Northeast Georgia Blue Ridge Mountain. And you can see the trunk transmission line sending the power from those rivers down into Atlanta. What was more than simply placing the, the burden of labor on its own shoulders, Arkwright once said, hydropower puts at the fingertips the force of the mountain torrents. It can perform the most delicate operation or accomplish the most stupendous task. It's a silent and unobtrusive servant in the home, always ready without rest, vacation, sick leave or sleep, eager for its task, tireless day and night, Sundays, holidays, every hour of every day of every year. It will banish drudgery and bring convenience and comfort and ease and cheer and joy. In both praising the river's work ethic and promising an end to toiling, Arkwright spoke to multiple white Southern constituencies who shared in the continued anxiety over the loss of their racial dominance. And Arkwright, it must be said, was the perfect spokesman for this product. He was a native of Savannah, Georgia. He drew his lineage back to the inventor, the English inventor Richard Arkwright. Um, he graduated in the late 1880s from the University of Georgia and went to law school, bootstrapped himself into prominence in Atlanta, and married into the state's so-called bourbon aristocracy, the old kind of um, plantation aristocracy. No one really had a better pedigree or credentials for trying to link electricity backward and forward through time to a romantic life of moonlight and magnolias. If no one had quite the breeding for this position that Arkwright had, 
Other commentators nevertheless expressed similar thoughts on how to put Southern rivers to work for the South's white working class citizens. Atlanta lawyer Marion Jackson, writing for the Progressive Survey Graphic Magazine in 1924, fretted over the conditions in which Dixie found itself in the early 20th century. Poverty, economic dependence, we might say the loss of mastery in general, could be eradicated if Southerners would only enslave the rivers, he wrote. Southern rivers, according to Jackson, were millions upon millions of potential slaves, capable of working not one wonder in a single home, but a myriad of miracles, a myriad of times, in countless fields, factories, and homes, at the touch of a button. Jackson was no corporate apologist or spokesman. In fact, he thought the Georgia Railway and Powers Network of dams and power lines was not nearly extensive or inclusive enough. He made his claims as an officer of the Municipal League of Georgia, an organization created in the World War I years that sought to bring to life in Georgia a publicly controlled hydropower commission based directly on the Hydroelectric Commission of Ontario. Jackson lamented that power equal to the labor of 75 million men this is his words, over five times the Negro population of the United States is idle in the streams of the South because they're undeveloped. Yet these idle slaves in the South, which is the title of the article that he wrote, remain unchained and unemployed, which for him remain the sin and the shame of our age, as their idleness kept innumerable Southerners of, quote, the purest strain living under conditions approximating those of the Middle Ages. Keeping Southern rivers idle and Southern people impoverished, the writer argued, was a cabal, a cabal of corporate monopolists, represented by Preston Arkwright and others, who both manufactured and benefited from energy scarcity. There's no incentive to capital, he wrote, to take the hazard of developing water power and constructing transmission lines to carry power through the thinly populated countryside. So long as capital can skim the cream of the business in the Piedmont districts and hoard by holding them idle, the great bulk of the water powers at the South, it would continue to reap a golden harvest, while nearly all farmers and many city dwellers struggled through these pre-modern conditions. Jackson could only see one solution to these problems. The idle slaves should be put to work by and for the common people of the South. That is, Southern workers must force their rivers to produce electric energy at a much higher rate than the Georgia, power, the Rail, Georgia Railway and Power Company had managed to perform the labor in the 20th century that African Americans as slaves had performed in the 19th. Even if white Southerners found comfort in the notion that hydroelectricity as slave would serve them as masters, they realized that this antebellum world that they dreamed about would never quite be recovered. In fact, the typical position at the time in the New South was that as glorious as the Old South had supposedly been, white Southerners were delighted that they were no longer saddled with the duties that attended owning slaves. The new form of white mastery then, that based in hydroelectricity, would surpass that under the system of antebellum slavery. Rivers and electrical servants, to yet again quote Preston Arkwright, he spoke a lot, were superior to the slaves, in his words, to the slaves who cost many times as much. These modern slaves, now that they'd been shackled, lacked the former slaves' undesirable qualities about which whites so often had complained. There isn't a lazy man among them, he said, they require no taskmaster, no overseer, no boss. And most significant of all, the new electrical servants would be a radically leveling force, permitting all whites, regardless of class structure, to share in the superiority for the first time since the end of slavery, and perhaps even for the first time ever. Again, Arkwright's words, they work for rich and poor with the same willingness. The quality of their work is the same to all without reference to financial, social, or political position. This type of appeal to the cross-class nature of the work that hydroelectric energy would provide was likewise meaningful in a southern progressive era context in which labor's power was on the rise. Working-class whites participated in elections in substantial numbers across the South and especially in Georgia and union membership in places like Atlanta, maybe surprisingly, outpaced national averages. Added to the ever-increasing roles of labor unions in places like Atlanta were the seemingly incessant walkouts and strikes in textile mills, lumber mills, coal mining, uh, and other industries in Dixie. So then if electric boosters promised white Southerners that they would make a slave of every stream and put a slave of every socket, 
they also pledged to make every white man a captain of industry, so to speak. Hydroelectricity offered not only a new form of white supremacy, but a new weapon for foes of Southern unionization and labor radicalism. Electricity never goes on strike. It never asks for better wages or better working conditions, never succumbs to the seduction of socialism. And this is exactly the type of idea that Alabama Power Company executive Ashton Collins had in mind when he created his Ready Kilowatt character, which you may well know is housed, the, the collection uh, is housed here in, in the Archive Center. Um, Ready Kilowatt was a spokeservant for electricity created in the mid-1920s, um, again with all these ideas in mind. One of the early ideas uh, that Collins had for the Ready Kilowatt character was a quote, Negro bellhop, uh, to work as the, the servant for white consumers of electricity, but for reasons that are, aren't made clear or haven't survived in the, in the company's papers, um, he decided to go with uh, the lightning bolts embodied. Um, it is also telling that in, in drafts of these papers about the origins of the Ready Kilowatt Corporation in the 1940s and 1950s, uh, the idea of the bellhop is redacted. At any rate, hydropower boosters, at the very least, promised to resurrect this idea of hair-invoked democracy that purportedly reigned in the antebellum years. Such a position was of particular importance in the years following the abortive populist revolt of the 1890s, which kind of carried on in um, a different form in the beginning of the 20th century and saw white workers fighting against the planner aristocracy, industrial elites, and even African Americans. So a little more than a decade after its introduction, electric streetcar travel and to um, excuse me, a lesser extent, electric lighting had become embedded in the experiences of daily life and at least in the minds of working class whites produced as much harm as it did good. Electrical modernization, most particularly as it was experienced on the streetcars, um, many working whites believed, had elevated black southerners to a state of equality with themselves, resulting in violent conflict in a city that had supposedly traded retrograde racial hatred for a new south of moderation, progress, and industrial success, the idea that would emerge in the 1930s, 1940s in Atlanta, the, the city too busy to hate, was also already kind of in, uh, in circulation in slightly different form. Populist leader and white supremacist firebrand, a man named Tom Watson, wrote in his magazine in 1906, for example, that New South elites had invited Northern Capital to Dixie with the disastrous result that women and children had been dragged from the countryside and enslaved to an urban industrial machine that, quote, is grinding up their tender limbs into dividends. At the same time, these same forces had transformed former savages into black masters, depicted in April 1906 in his magazine in the image on the left, who in some outrageous cases held white slaves his words, in bestial degradation, again, his words. Now, Watson lamented, the state of Georgia has been completely conquered by a Wall Street combination that supported railroads and electric companies, electric companies pictured as a beast slithering into the south. Um, it's probably very difficult to read, but on the, the octopus's face there, you can see the power companies written across. And in the bottom left of the image, you can see a couple of people who are in danger of being devoured. And they're also pretty tellingly coming over the precipice, which is pouring water, the, dam, uh, the, the river that would possibly provide hydropower. <clears throat> this type of thinking uh, helped give rise to one of the ugliest episodes in Atlanta's history, the race riot of 1906. And it also helped give rise to calls for radical change. Working class Southerners and middle class reformers like Tom Watson believe that in order to save their civilization from decay and the chaos of so-called Negro domination, they must swiftly enact strict public controls over corporations through a movement for public ownership, which could only truly be achieved if done in concert with the expansion of white male democracy and the disfranchisement of African Americans. So the, the public ownership movement, which I really won't discuss here, but I can discuss uh, in the Q&A if you'd like, emerged once again in the World War I era. This is the ownership movement that Marion Jackson picked up on was linked into a broader national movement 
a development that frightened public, uh, I should say private utilities, and later helped create both the TVA and the Rural Electrification Administration. So then, in addition to guaranteeing a democratic existence for all white men, electric boosters, especially in the private sector in the 1920s, promised that their conquest of nature would help keep white and black workers apart. It would help them avoid the racial conflict that they saw emerging in the streets of Atlanta and other places um, in the years before World War I. White workers could enjoy urban industrial modernity, and African Americans would be forced out of cities and back into the countryside where many whites agreed they were a more natural fit. Especially in prospectuses meant for potential investors in New England whose cotton mills, et cetera, that they were trying to lure southward, utility managers assured textile mill owners that recent labor troubles in the South, and more importantly, recent labor troubles in the Northeast would not plague them if they moved their operations to Dixie where there was plenty of cheap hydropower. The reason they could make such assurances was that the South was overflowing, not only with cheap hydropower, but also with docile labor drawn from Georgia's Blue Ridge Mountains. Not only had these, pure, uh, these mountaineers of pure Anglo-Saxon stock been shielded from the radical doctrines of European rabble-rousers, according to a Georgia uh, utility uh, publication in 1923, but many uh, but to many of these people, these uh, laborers from the mountains, a Negro, quote unquote, was a curiosity. There would be no chance of interracial labor organization or really labor organization in any case. And control over the rivers uh, in, in the service of further industrialization of the South would then control implied, uh, would then imply control over African Americans, who quite often, and this, these images, believe it or not, are drawn from a power company prospectus in 1923, uh, which, so this implication of control, white control over African Americans, uh, quite often came with images such as these, where um, African Americans were shown in ragged clothes picking cotton as if back in the days of slavery. And for potential investors, this control would extend not only to African Americans, but also to white folks. Um, who were seen as not really workers at all. In the images that investment prospectuses uh, sent to New England uh, textile mill owners uh, of the mills that they had themselves, white workers are almost never seen. Um, they're never laboring at all. And if they're in the images, they're kind of standing idly by um, in some sort of a leisurely position, uh, almost enjoying themselves at work. Only rivers, factories, and African Americans were shown uh, actually doing any labor. Of course, hydroelectricity never became a panacea for the problems and anxieties of the New South. In fact, by the mid-1920s or so, hydropower across the Deep South was increasingly seen as suspect for lots of people. And the agricultural economy had all but collapsed at that time, sending hundreds of thousands of black and white Southerners to cities in the Northeast and into the Midwest. Nonetheless, electric boosters idealized hydropower as a crucial component in the South's ascent from the depths of the 1870s. And some years later, a former governor reflected on what electricity had meant to his native South and meant, in his words, enlightenment progress and the profitable, profitable development of natural resources. But it was more than just that. It's far more than just the story of the climb from obscurity to prominence, he continued. It's part of the remarkable story of a state and its dramatic emergence from the despair and desolation of Reconstruction days. Certainly this transition, the one to hydroelectricity, remade and in many ways problematized Southern life, but at the same time, hydropower was cast as a miraculous solution to the problems posed by the onset of modernity in much the same way that coal and then nuclear energy would be in the years during and after World War II. A discussion of the ways that race, nature, and electricity were used to sell the New South and hydropower is crucial, I think, to understanding not only the problems associated with our current dependence on non-renewable energy sources, but how the creation of energy regimes and the conquest of nature include the conquest of people as well. Thank you. <laughs>